Dr. D, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. Excited to have you on and uh, and welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Very excited. Thanks to, to you and Dr. Fitz uh, for having me on the podcast. Very excited to talk uh, talk freely about a topic I love, uh, nerve surgery. And uh, I, I think that what you guys are doing is fantastic. Um, you know, bringing education to people in different, uh, different forms and, and different formats uh, is really helpful. So congrats on what you guys are doing. Well, we definitely appreciate that. And, and congrats to you too. I know you, you host a podcast and we'll, we'll get into that here in a few, but you know, congrats to you on hosting that. And again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come on and talk about some nerves. I know that is a, a very special interest of yours. So I'm hoping we can dive deeply into it here in a bit. Yeah, no, we, we have, uh, you know, Chuck and I have had a fun time doing our podcast. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's reached a lot of people in ways that I would not have expected. Um, so it's, uh, I can see the power of the, the podcast and uh, I commend you for doing something that is aimed at uh, orthopedic trainees and anybody that wants to learn about orthopedics. Yeah, and so we, we typically do is we kind of just ask a couple of questions, getting to know you, and then we'll kind of jump into the topic. So the first question I have, general question, do you have any advice that you would give yourself if you had to look back and you, you know you see yourself as a resident or just starting residency or maybe even just finishing? Is there any advice that you go back and tell yourself? You know, it's funny. Uh, I think that it's become cliche, but I would I would probably um, tell myself to be present and enjoy it because you know one thing that I was told when I was a resident uh, towards the end is that uh, the days are long and the years are short and. Um, you know, now as a dad, uh, I can't help but turn into dad mode. And there's this uh, <laughs> you know, kid cartoon called Daniel Tiger. And uh, there's going to be some residents who are listening to this who have no idea what I'm talking about, because I had no idea what kids shows were when I was a resident. Yeah, I have no I'm idea what you're talking little, about right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 so there's a little jingle that they have that I think summarizes it well, but it's super cheesy. But it's, uh, it's enjoy the wow that's happening now. Okay. And to be honest with you, I mean, really, like, think about it. Like, right now, you're a resident. You get the privilege, and you may not view it as a privilege. You may view it as a duty right now, which is okay, given the lens you're coming from. Uh, not you, but just the proverbial you. Yeah. Um, you know, you get to operate on somebody else's patients. You may have to see them for a day or two afterwards, maybe at the post-op visit. But I own that patient forever. But you get to come in and you get to do the case. Like, you know, if you come prepared and you come correct and you do your, you know, um, you do well, you get to do the case. And uh, I get to see the patient for however long I have to see them for. Right. That's, you get to deal with the complications and everything. Well, I mean, it's not, no. I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, complications are rare, but I mean, you know, it's right. uh, I, I have to see the patient, look them in the eye and tell them that I was one who was, you know, directly supervising their surgery or indirectly supervising however you, you know, whatever the, however the case went. But I mean, you know, that is amazing. Like if I just got to operate on other people's patients as a technician to kind of learn my craft, you know, again, that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, so enjoy it. Like enjoy this opportunity to just learn. Um, you know, I think that when I was a resident, I focused more on too much perhaps on the future. Um, and I, I think that there's a role for focusing on the future and what it can do for you and all that kind of things and setting yourself up for a great career. Um, but really focus on being technically excellent. Focus on getting everything you can out of every clinical interaction you have, whether it's, you know, like the, the, the 30th consult of the night or whether it's the 40th patient in the clinic or whether it's the seventh surgery of the day, get the most out of it. I think that's solid advice. I am a big proponent and believer in the and the saying of being in the present and enjoying where you're at now and not necessarily saying, oh, well, I'll finally be happy when I'm, you know, out there on my own practicing instead of, you know, because then you may get there and then, you, then, you know, you're looking for the next thing, but enjoying where you're at now and, and, and taking the time out to just like you said, perfect your craft. So solid yeah, I mean, advice. Even, yeah. I mean, even as you get towards, you know, the senior years of your residency and, and you start to differentiate towards what you think you want to do in a fellowship, if you're going to do a fellowship, you know, think about like, you know, I'm going into hand, for example, like what can guy, what can I get out of this spine rotation? And I was actually just telling my fellow today, I wish I had paid more attention during ACDFs uh, because now I'm a brachial plexus surgeon. 
And I am literally inches away from where you would do an ACDF. Uh, and if I had, you know, paid a little more attention, perhaps I would have learned a few more tricks if I'm trying to find a, a cervical nerve root, or for example, to graft into, et cetera. Um, and I feel confident in my surgical skills now, but you, know, you can always learn something about, you know, how a different subspecialist does something, different instrument, you know, different tactic. I mean, there's so much. So like when you start a rotation, even though, you know, you know I'm going into, uh, I'm going into trauma, but, you know, I'm on this joint rotation, like, yeah, you got to learn how to do a really good hemi or a really good total hip. Um, yeah. Or perhaps you might have to do a, you know, an ER for plasty in your practice in the future. So you really got to pay attention. So figure out, sit down and think, like take a few minutes and say, what am I going to learn on this rotation that I can actually use in my practice in the future? And if you go into it that way, you know, when I have residents that come into my rotation or fellows that come into my rotation and they're not going to do peripheral nerve, or for example, the residents are not going to do hand. If they come in and just look me now and say, look, I'm not doing hand. I want to learn, you know, X, Y, and Z. I can say, fine. Like, it's perfect. I'm going to teach you these things. Uh, and if that's what you take away from my rotation, all the better. Yeah. There was a, um, we had a recent guest before who, who mentioned the, you know, kind of the mindset of with every rotation that you go into it, kind of having the mindset of saying like, this is what I want to do. And if you have uh, that mentality, even if it may not be the thing you want to do, but if you have that mentality and, and you go for each, each rotation and get the most out of it, you can, you may pick up some skills. just like you're saying that you may be able to use uh, in your in a different specialty or in your practice in the future. So, again, just just solid advice. I hope people are taking notes, Doctor D. I, re I really do. <laughs> oh man. Um, uh, and the next thing is, we know you also have a podcast, Upper Hand. You know, with you yourself and Chuck, and you talk about hand surgery. What made you start that podcast? What what made? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? And what made you want to start that podcast? Uh, you know, I, I think that you know, we started it before the pandemic, and I know you guys have been doing this for a while too, um, you know, and, and we thought about, you know, how do people consume media now? Like, for example, like when I have a resident start the rotation, I actually try to make a conscious effort to ask them, like, you know, how do you learn? Are you a book learner, or a video learner, an article learner, you know, so I can feed you education in a way that's going to suit your needs. So then you think about like, how, how do I personally, how was I consuming media? Um, I would listen to podcasts and because I had a commute, you know, not everybody has a commute, you know, based on where you live, but, you know, I had a commute, I would drive, I'd be in a car about 15 to 20 minutes a day, you know, perhaps, uh, morning and after morning and afternoon. And, uh, I'd want to listen to something and it was usually news podcasts or whatever, cause that was available. Um, but I felt like, you know, what, what could we, um, what would be useful to somebody who wanted to hear, you know, about hand surgery. And you don't want to make it a stuffy, hoity-toity academic discussion about the latest <laughs> article and the research yeah. methods or whatever. It's got to be like, you know, hey, like, here's some real talk. Like, here's what, here's what we talk about. Like, if we were in conference and like, actually just like chatting about a case. Um, and that's where it was kind of born. And I'm fortunate enough to have a great partner in the process, uh, Chuck Goldfarb. He is, uh, you know, our, now our executive vice chair, basically a member of two in our department. And at that time was, uh, you know, co-chief of our hand service. Um, and, you know, I, I asked him, I was like, hey, do you think this would make sense? And he thought it would make sense too. And uh, we kind of went into, into it together. And, uh, and you know, based on, uh, you know, you guys, it's easier to do it together. It's hard it to do a podcast on, on your own. It's a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, and you don't want this to become a chore. And I was actually having this conversation with one of my colleagues, uh, Megan Conti Mika in Chicago, because um, we do something for the Hand Society called First Hand, which is like a, you know, kind of a classic article slash master class lecture series once a month. Yeah. And we were talking about like, what, why do we do it? And it's like, it's fun. Like I learn something every time I do a podcast. I learn something every time I do First Hand. I'm so stressful. Obviously, you're speaking in front of people. You're on video in front of people um, for some of that stuff. But it's worth it because you're learning something, you're having fun, you're adding to the conversation. So I think that was important to us to reach new people. And then also it allows us to showcase, you know, honestly, what we do here at WashU, which is we educate. We, we like what we do. We love what we do. We like to educate. So I, I think that's just one more way to reach people. I love it. Great story. And for anybody that is listening, that is interested, particularly in hand, Go and check out that podcast. I saw a couple of recent episodes you have on um, on peripheral nerve repair. One talking about distal radiuses. So, 
definitely go and check out that podcast. And again, we're so happy to have you on. And one more thing I thought was was very interesting. I just wanted to at least get you to touch on really quick before we hop into the topic is you mentioned you have a lot of international experience in your training, especially, you know, particular nerve training. Can you kind of just tell us about about like how was that experience and, and, and what did you gain from it? Well, I mean, I think that um, there's a lot to be learned by going and visiting people. And I think that that's something that a lot of people talked about doing. Obviously, this is all pre-pandemic, but you want to see different approaches to things. And I think timing of it is really interesting because, you know, you come out of residency and fellowship and you want to go somewhere and you want to, you want to operate. You think it's super important to scrub. But in a lot of these observership kind of things, you're going to learn so much more if you don't scrub because you're not worried about where your hands are and they think you can operate, like all that kind of stuff. Like you actually, like when you go visit somebody, you want to learn either indications or just like very specific technical aspects. Um, and, and in traveling to all these different places, I traveled at different points, either at, in training or in the early parts of, you know, or the earlier parts, I should say, of being an attending. And I picked up different things at different places because I had gone at different points in my technical ability. And I think that, you know, it's so valuable. And, you know, obviously once we're all hopefully past this pandemic and hopefully soon, you know, taking the time out of your lives to go visit somebody and, and show interest and be engaged and take something home to your practice, it's going to make you that much better. And then there are obviously some benefits with regards to, you know, saying that you went somewhere and did some things. I know that, you know, for example, like a lot of shoulder folks, like it's a rite of passage to go through and do the tour and, and you know, the different places in, in Paris and like, you know, to see those folks. Um, and then obviously the, the trauma people, you go to the AO, you go to, you know, all the places in Switzerland and yeah. you know, you're, you're, it, it's valuable from a marketing perspective. But also there's networking, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and I think that if you go at different points in your career, you're going to get different things. Yeah. And I've noticed the the importance of being able to watch, you know, others operate now because, you know, as I'm right now, I'm a third year, about to be a fourth year soon. And now I, I, I see myself asking the question, well, how do they, you know, how do they dissect or how do they do that approach? How do, you know, do they use a knife? What angle is the knife at? You know, how are they handling the instrument? So I definitely think you can learn a lot from observing. Um, and I think that was, you know, that's an excellent uh, point that you just made. So kind of transitioning and getting into the talk of the day, we're going to talk about some nerve injuries and repairs. And I just have just a, you know, just a standardized case. So say, for example, uh, Dr. Dr. D, one of your residents says, hey, we had this 45-year-old guy. He presented to the ED. He had a stab wound to his anterior forearm physical exam, you know, he had inability to flex the stomach and phalangeal joint as well as weakness was flexing some of the other fingers and he had decreased sensation about the palmar radial aspect of the hand. Um, So we're suspecting that this guy may have a possible nerve injury, but before we jump too deeply into it, what are just, what are, what are, what's the sum of the anatomy of a nerve if we're just breaking it all the way down? What are we, what are some of the different structures we need to know and what are their functions? Well, so, so forgive me for going, you know, off topic, but, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, you know, is that, you know, with this stab wound is, you know, is it a nerve injury or is it a nerve injury and something else? Um, because obviously in the volar forearm, you know, there's a possibility of you getting in, you know, the, the injury getting into the actual tendons themselves. Right. And the last thing I want to do as a quote nerve person is to pigeonhole myself into thinking it's all about the nerve. Correct. So, you know, you want to check for, you know, integrity of the long flexors. So the FPL and the FDPs and the FDSs um, through a tenodesis test. So, you know, you're taking your wrist into passive extension and looking for that normal cascade. And, you know, I never quite understood tenodesis, you know, when I was a resident, but literally try it on yourself or try it on a family member and like, just get them to like really relax and then just passively extend their wrist and just watch how the fingers normally fall into that cascade of flexion. And the next time you see a patient with a, in a, you know, a possible uh, flexor tendon time injury, whether it's in, you know, the, in the finger and the palm and like that zone two area, or even in, you know, the, the forearm spaghetti wrist kind of territory, do the tenodesis when they're asleep and you will get that exam and you will see that one finger sticking up in the air as the other fingers come down. Um, but that's the first thing I think about. But in terms of oh, nerves. That's good. Sorry, great go pearls. You know, those are great pearls. 
um, to definitely think about and, and not being just like you said, pigeonholed into automatically thinking it's a nerve injury. So I'm, I'm glad you just touched on that, but now go, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you think about, you know, the particular mechanism uh, that you described sharp injury, right? So, um, and I think you'll get into this a little bit later, but that's very different than a blunt trauma in terms of yeah. how you triage and what to do with it. Um, because a sharp injury, potentially you could repair, you know, pretty quickly as soon as, you know, uh, feasible from a logistics and, you know, overall patient perspective as possible. Um, but, you know, you think about the different components of the nerve. And I like to think of a nerve, you know, as like a coax cable. It's got, you know, a hard kind of outer, you know, uh, outer layer. And then it's got all these fibers on the inside. And the, the main fiber is, is the axon. And, you know, that's the main unit of the nerve. And then you've got bundles of axons together that are grouped, you know, by this, um, you know, uh, you know, so each axon has its endoneurium. And then you have the number of, of, of fibers grouped together in, by the perineurium. And, you know, you have your groups of, um, uh, you have your groups of fascicles, you know, encased by that perineurium. Uh, and then with, you have this kind of squishy layer on the inside, the internal epineurium. And then all that is just kind of, grouped together by the epineurium. And the epineurium has its own, you know, blood vessels on it. And that's what you, you know, what you see when you think of a nerve. You know, you see, you know, almost like a wet noodle with a blood vessel running along it. That is yeah. what you see. You see the external epineurium with that vessel running along it. And, and more into the, you know, the blood supply of the vessel, can you kind of go over some of the arterial systems? Like how, how do these uh, nerves, these axons get their blood supply? Well, so, I mean, you know, they get, um, they get blood supply from, you know, vessels that run longitudinally along those nerves. And, you know, segmentally, you'll have small little branches coming off of those longitudinally running vessels, you know, those nutrient type vessels that will feed into the external epineurium. And then eventually those vessels will give small little branches into the nerve in, you know, within, within the nerve between the perineurium, um, the bundles of the fascicles. And so you have all these vessels inside the nerves too. So if you've ever seen a nerve like cut back to healthy fascicles, you'll see this kind of bleeding within the nerve. And those are the small little nerves within, um, uh, the small little vessels uh, within the nerve that indicate that you're back at healthy nerve if you're cutting back the healthy fascicles. If you're in a scar zone, you're not gonna see a healthy blood supply to that nerve. Um, so I think that's one thing that, you know, is super important if you're, when you're treating nerve injuries. Excellent. And kind of just to review that, we spoke about the endoneurium, which pretty much surrounds that, that axon. And then you have the perineurium, which surrounds those, those fascicles, um, or those bundles of axons. Then you have your inner, you know, epineurium and then your epineurium. And then you can also see your blood vessels on top of that. Now, one of the things that I, I got confused about for a long period of time were all these different terms like the neuropraxia versus neurotomesis. Can you kind of go over what the different terms are just so we can have a basic, you know, understanding of what these different terms are and what they mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when nerve injuries were originally being classified, um, you know, uh, they thought about, you know, very simplistically is the nerve intact or not, right? So if the nerve is not intact, you know, you have two, literally two ends of a nerve, that's a neurotomatic injury, the most severe, okay? It's pretty easy to say that's probably not gonna get better on its own unless you have some, you know, uh, some fateful case where the nerve ends are lying right next to each other um, in, in good alignment. So probably most likely not gonna get better on its own. Uh, and then you have cases where perhaps you have, you know, uh, a crush injury to the nerve, um, but the nerve is still intact. Um, that's probably an axonomatic injury. In, in some select cases, you can have a demyelinating injury to a nerve, which is the quote neuroapraxic injury. I think that in orthopedics, for some reason with nerves, we tend to think that things are going to get better on their own, um, which many times they will. Um, you know, we always think that nerves or, you know, nerve injuries are quote neuropraxic, um, that, you know, it's just a demyelinating injury, but I bet more often than not, there is a low grade axonomatic injury. Um, you know, so that's that middle grade of injury where it's honestly really hard to figure out what's going on with the nerve. 
you know, because my job as somebody who is treating patients with nerve injuries is to see that injury, see that patient, understand the mechanism of injury, and try to prognose what is going to happen to that nerve. Is it going to get better on its own? Is it going to, you know, inevitably not get better? And do I leave myself enough time to intervene in whatever way necessary to get, you know, um, to get axons to that muscle before it atrophies? Um, right. So that's, that's the rub there. That's when it's really hard to figure out, you know, because everything's not neuropraxium. I think that we tend to chalk things up to neuropraxium when it's not. Yeah, and I, I know I'm almost positive in, in my history, in my very short limited experience, I have misnomered or misnamed, uh, you know, something that's neuropraxic that I say is neuro neuropraxia, which may not necessarily be a neuropraxia. Um, so it's definitely good to, you know, be able to know um, that there could be kind of like a, a range of, of injury to the nerve. We may not exactly know what's going on. Um, but just to recap, you said a neurotomatic injury is when you have injury of the entire nerve. Exonomatic injury is when you have an injury to the axon, but the, the connective tissue or the tissue around the nerve may still be intact. And then kind of this demyelinating injury, that's kind of the neuropraxic injury. And what, because I always, at least I've definitely always seen these in test questions. How do you, is there a special way that you remember what you lose first and what you gain first as far as, you know, the function of these nerves or function of the muscles? I always hear, you know, motor versus touch or pain, sympathetics, you know, is there any way that you use to remember that? You know, first off, I think that any test questions that try to have you differentiate between neuropraxic and axonomatic injuries are inevitably unfair because I think many practicing hand surgeons and peripheral nerve surgeons will disagree on that or on their, uh, you know, uh, yeah. when we're discussing things. So that's, but, you know, in terms of like things that you lose first, right? Like it totally depends on like what kind of nerve it is, right? Okay. You know, so, um, you know, I, I, I know that the test will tell you that if you have a mixed nerve, you're going to lose the motor first, and then you're going to lose proprioception and then touch and then temperature and pain and sympathetic. And the recovery tends to be the opposite direction. But I will tell you, you know, where this, you know, there's the test world and there's, there's the real world. And it's a mixed bag, right? So it totally depends on what kind of nerve you have. You know, is it a mixed nerve? Is it a motor nerve? Is it a, you know, a sensory nerve, depending on where you catch it along the chain? Uh, and it, when you're dealing with the injuries that you're trying to figure out the most, you know, they're all, they're, it, it is completely gray. Okay. All right. No, I'm uh, sorry if that doesn't help you with anything. No. <laughs> no, that helps. No, it does help. I mean, you know, because there's always a, a test question or a test answer and then and in real life. And, you know, you see this not just with, with you know, hand questions, but with questions all over, you know. So it's, I think it's good to realize that what may be the test answer in real life when these patients come to your clinic, it may not necessarily present that way. So if you don't know that, you may, you know, it may be something that you don't think about and something that you don't catch. So I think it's something that we should all at least know and then therefore be able to recognize when an injury may present itself in a not so uh, classic or testable, you know, form or question. Well, I mean, like, you know, when you have an injury that, you know, say it is purely a sensory nerve, like for example, say you got the superficial radial nerve and it was cut and you repaired it and it's recovering. Like you will get, you know, pinprick pain sensation first. And then you will get, you know, hot and cold sensation first. And then you will get moving two-point discrimination first. Then you will get static two-point discrimination. And then you'll get, you know, the, you know, the vibratory tuning fork kind of things next. So that does happen, but it's just so rare that you get that injury, that you get to follow that patient, you know, in, in that order. Because more likely you're going to get, you know, a crush injury to the median nerve, which is likely, a, you know, a Sunderland three versus four axonomatic injury. And you, you and your attending are trying to figure out whether it's going to get better on its own. You might see a little bit improvement in sensation. You might see a little bit of improvement in motor and then it plateaus and then you don't know what to do. And then you have to explore or you say, you know what, you're going to get what you're going to get. And that's it. Uh, and that's the real world. So, <laughs> yeah. There is just, you know, the test questions are, are such because, you know, sometimes they're true in very cut and dry black and white scenarios. But mm -hmm. as you mentioned, the real world is not black and white, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, but, or maybe fortunately, you know, there's always like, a, you know, a spectrum of um, things that can happen. Yeah. But moving yeah. on, 
Um, moving on, the is there are there any classification systems that you go by? I know there, there's one that I always see. I always see the Sunderland, but I know there's also a set on classification. I may have mispronounced that that name. Um, but you know, are there any classification systems that you go by? And if you and if there are, can you kind of let us know? Uh, can you kind of discuss with us what what it is? And, well, I mean, I think classification systems, you know, I, I struggle with this because, I, you know, classification systems need to be useful in terms of, you know, we have to have a common language about things. Yeah. Um, you know, for the, for instance, for nerve injury, you're, you're trying to figure out, you know, how severe is this injury? Is it mild and it's going to get better on its own? Is it the most severe and it's not going to get better on its own? And the sudden classification, you know, essentially gives us that with these three kind of categories. And where the rub is, is this axonomatic injury, which is the gray area. And then what, what Sidney Sunderland, excuse me, Sir Sidney Sunderland tried to do <laughs> was to, you know, break down that axonomatic category into prognoses. The problem is, you know, you look at how uh, Sunderland, you know, subcategorized Seddon's axonomatic classification. It is a very anatomic classification that is almost impossible to differentiate aside from on clinical examination, as you've watched the patient evolve over time. Um, the problem is if you wait for a Sunderland two versus four to declare itself, sometimes you're waiting a long period of time. And then once you find out it's a Sunderland four, if you found out too late, you have missed a window of opportunity to intervene uh, in a manner in which you can actually try to get some axons you know, back to that distal stump into the distal muscle before irreversible atrophy occurs. Right. But yeah. Okay. You know, the sudden classification, the sudden classification, they're all, you know, they're, they're fair game for tests. You can memorize them, you know, right before you go into a test. But again, you know, this is one thing where we really kind of struggle in that axonomatic category, because until you cut into a nerve and you send a histologic section, you will not know. Mm. Yeah. I think that's another I think there's another thing that's good to, you know, conceptualize and, and understand and, you know, but in, you know, in reality, it's, it's like you said, it's kind of hard to tell, except for these axonomatic, you know, type of injuries. It's hard to decide whether a type two is a type two or if it's a type four. Um, yeah. I mean, like, you know, if I cut in, into a nerve, like with my loops on and maybe under a microscope, can I really tell, can I really truly reliably tell <laughs> the difference between a three and a four? No. And yeah. anybody that's telling you that is, is, you know, probably wrong. Now, right. a histologic slide in the microscope, et cetera, you can, but you know, you're not, I personally am not going to be waiting for a histologic classification in the operating room. Frozen yeah. section probably won't tell me that. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things where you have to make decisions on the fly in the operating room based on what you see, you know, based on what is literally in front of you. And you mentioned a little bit earlier kind of about, you know, when, when nerves regenerate versus degenerate, but can you kind of just talk a little bit about the physiology behind when nerves do degenerate, you know, what happens when the axons transected, what happens, anything, any changes happen with a cell body, you know, any type of degeneration, you know, can you kind of just explain that or, or, or touch base on that? Yeah. So, I mean, the biggest thing that you think about what happens when a nerve gets injured is that you immediately have preparation for the nerve to regrow. Um, so you think about, you know, say, for example, we have a nice example of uh, a neurotomatic injury, uh, a sudden three or a Sunderland five, and the nerve is cut. And on the proximal end, there is preparation to regenerate that axon. So you get these macrophages and these Schwann cells that are phagocytosing all this debris. They're getting rid of all the junk. And then eventually you have these tubes that form, you know, these so-called you know, bands of Bunger, and you have this like axonal sprout coming from the proximal stump that's just kind of feeling its way out, trying to figure out where the distal stump is. And that's where you get things like a growth cone um, that is just kind of looking for the distal stump. And there are cues that you're going to get from the distal stump. So there's this, you know, process of, of neurotrophism. Um, in which you're going to get growth factors coming down and you're going to get neurotropism with a P. Um, this is a chemotaxis is like this like pheromones like emitted from the distal stump to try to allure that proximal stump to grow down. Um, but what's also happening on the distal end of the stump is that you have Wallerian degeneration. And this is again a cleaning house kind of process that starts on a cellular level, you know, three to four hours from the injury. 
and it grossly becomes visible about three or four days, and it becomes detectable by EMG and nerve conduction studies by about three to four weeks, which is why you don't get a nerve study any earlier than three or four weeks. But in that Wallerian degeneration, it's disintegration of distal axon, distal myelin by these phagocytes and macrophages, and, um, and it is literally just getting the distal stump ready to receive the regenerating axon. Um, and this was described when Waller was, you know, experimenting on the hypoglossal nerve of frogs. Um, so the big buzzwords for those of you that are taking exams is that this Wallerian degeneration, you know, starts to occur pretty early. All of these processes are trying to get the nerve ready to regenerate across the proximal stump, you know, from the proximal stump to the distal stump, assuming that the two nerve ends are somewhat, you know, in the same neighborhood. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to think about it and remember is, is you know, the you're getting ready for the nerve to regenerate. So, so what do you need to do? You know, proximally, you have your, uh, you know, your neurotropic factors that, that kind of help with the axon survival and extension back to where it needs to go. And, and distally, you're having that kind of Wallerian degeneration, degeneration uh, where that axon is breaking down, you know, distal to the injury, getting ready to receive that you know, the, the new um, uh, regenerated uh, neurite or, or axon that happens about three or four days uh, since it's transected. And, and since you mentioned EMG, I, I always have a hard time trying to decide, you know, how do you, I guess, how do you go about deciding your, your algorithm, you know, so, do you, so if you suspect a nerve injury, do you have them come back in, you know, three weeks, do you have them come back in three months, or, you know, do you get an EMG? Like what? What does what? Uh, what drives your surgical uh, decision making? Well, I mean, a couple of thoughts that come with that. I mean, I think you have to to realize that an EMG nerve conduction study is purely an extension of your physical exam. I don't use it. You know, this is going to sound like come across the wrong way, but like, I don't use it to diagnose a nerve injury. I use it to corroborate my physical examination, my clinical impression, and perhaps to help with staging and prognosis. Um, because perhaps I can detect things that I can't get on my exam. But I typically am able to localize a lesion and get to a diagnosis without a nerve study. So I like getting a nerve study at six weeks, typically, because Wallerian degeneration has occurred. And if it's something where I know that, you know, uh, that I don't have any information as to whether the nerve is, you know, like actually intact or disrupted, it is helpful in that regard. Um, the six-week study is useful mainly to help get the patient on board with the diagnosis because patients like having, you know, tests, to be honest with you. Um, and it's useful when you're trying to track it against a three-month exam. And a three-month exam is super important because typically that's when most um, Sunderland 4 or the high-grade axonomatic injuries have declared themselves. If they don't have any return of motor units on, you know, an EMG level by three months, it's probably not going to come back. And that's kind of dogma, to be honest with you. We're writing an article for the Yellow Journal right now, the Journal of the uh, AAOS, on you know nerve studies. So you know, check that out whenever it comes out. But you know, we were asked about this three-month dogma about when motor units come back, and it really is dogma. Like there isn't much to substantiate, but I tell you that most people believe in it. Um, and you know, so if you don't have something by three months, it typically has declared itself as a Sunderland four, and then you have to decide as the surgeon, whether you think you can help that person with surgical intervention, or you're going to say, you've got what you got. We're going to observe this, you know, uh, expectant management, and then maybe tendon transfers or something down the line. I admit I'm pretty aggressive with how I manage nerve injuries because I'm pretty confident in my ability to do something if I get to the zone of injury. And I, I think that, uh, I, I try to keep myself in check by saying, you know, if I get to the zone of injury and the nerve uh, is pretty broadly injured and I'm not going to get any regeneration down a graft, I can pivot pretty quickly to tendon transfers. But I think what that allows me to do is to, you know, the exploration is an extension of your exam as well. It helps you make the diagnosis. It helps you tell a patient, look them in the eye and say, you know what, you've got a bad injury. I explored it. There's nothing I can do other than say, you know what, let's do some tendon transfers down the line. And I think the last point I wanted to bring up, you know, based on what you said, is that unfortunately, you know, nerve injury patients are really bad at follow-up. Um, they're notorious for follow-up. Uh, I, I think you're, you're in Tulane, right? I am. So you, you, New Orleans, St. Louis, I mean, you know, like, um, you know, gunshot wounds are unfortunately a way of life in our cities. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, <laughs> you know, those patients, you know, just tend not to come back, which is tough. 
Um, it makes it really tough to get follow-up. So I, I personally will ask our residents to send me these patients with nerve injuries sooner, you know, within a month from injury, not because I'm going to do anything at that point, not because I'm going to get a nerve study at that point, but because I want to establish a relationship and trying to get them to come back. Um, you know, so that's more of the social aspect, you know, social determinants of health, and then more the humanistic aspect of what we do. But nerve injury patients are not great at follow-up. And then they also go through this emotional spiral for some of the more severe injuries that is easier to manage if you get, if you get them on your team or vice versa early on. So, so one question I have is say, you know, we're down to ED and they can actually see the nerves or at least what they think of the nerve ends acutely. Should they tag it with any sutures, just leave it and let it be. What is, what's your management as far as, you know, an acute injury and was the, you know, resident sends you a picture and you say, Hey, well, those, those are the nerve ends right there. You know, what do you, what do you do? Does it depend on if it's a sharp injury? Does it depend on if it's like a crush injury and then there's a big, you know, they have a wider zone, you know, can you kind of take me through your thought process there? Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I'll say that there's no right answer, right? So, I mean, I think that that's the point where you shouldn't be afraid to call your senior, call the fellow, call the attending, depending on your call structure, mm -hmm. just ask them. Because, you know, when I get a call in the middle of the night, what I want to know is, you know, have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about the, the thought processes? And then I will make the decision from there. That's my personal philosophy because there's so many considerations that may go into, you know, whether I go in that night to repair the nerve or whether I have them come back in, you know, the next day or two days or whether I see them on rounds the next morning or whether I have them come back in two weeks. Um, and it's so many things beyond what you can think of as, uh, you know, a junior resident or a senior resident even mm -hmm. that just let me make the decision. So it's more of, you know, I love the fact that you're like, you found, you diagnosed the injury and you're asking for how I would want to manage it. Um, you know, so I think that there are a couple of ways of going about the thought, you know, what to do here. So I don't think you should repair an ED, you know, and that's nothing against, you know, anybody working in the ED. It's just a matter of, I think I can do a better job in the operating room, you know, with, with loops or with a microscope probably then you can. And that is nothing against you guys. Cause if you came into the <laughs> operating room with loops at a microscope, you probably could do just as good of a job as I can. Right. Uh, it's just the environment, the setting, the resources, the lighting, you know, you're not, your pager's not blowing up, like all this kind of stuff. It's different. Yeah. It's different. You know, you're in, you're in the zone there as opposed to being called to go, you know, reduce a tibia and reduce a dosoratus fracture and see a fingertip lack and all this stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, call the attending, you know, cause sometimes sharp injuries can get, you know, fixed right away. And, you know, if you know, that's a patient that's not going to come back, you might as well fix it right then and there. Yeah. Um, I was so, going to say, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, cause, cause you know, we just spoke about having patients return back in three weeks and then possibly in three months. So what patients are, do, do you just wait and watch or, or what patients are you going in and repairing the nerve acutely? You know, uh, well, I mean, so, so the only injuries that you would really want to repair acutely are, you know, the clean and tidy transections. So not like a, you know, uh, a humerus fracture where somebody goes in and plates a humerus and finds a ruptured radial nerve from a closed injury. Like that is a blunt injury, even though the nerve is transected. It's really important and helpful to know that the nerve is transected because I'm not going to make them wait around for six weeks, three months to, to get to the point where you know, I realize it's not going to get better. I'm going to intervene sooner, but I'm not going to intervene the night of because I need that zone of injury on the nerve to declare itself, you know, which typically occurs three or four weeks after the actual injury. Because what you don't yeah. want to do is repair that injury night of or day one and then be within where there's going to be scar down the line because your nerve repair is going to fail. So then, but for example, say... Unfortunately, if you're in a scenario where somebody was plating a humerus and they cut the radial nerve, call me right away. I'll fix it right now. Right. Because that has a great chance of coming back sooner because it was a knife that came across that nerve. And I can repair that at time zero uh, and get that nerve going hopefully as soon as possible. Now, say, for example, you know, patients have these have these nerve injuries. What, what changes do you start to see in, you know, in the muscles, you know, we kind of talk about, you know, distal reinnervation, you know, is there a certain time when the muscle starts to atrophy and then, you know, when the motor end plates start to, you know, uh, malfunction, you know, can you kind of just talk on you know, a little bit about, you know, distal reinnervation? Well, I mean, the thing that you worry about, um, you know, with nerve injuries, particularly for, you know, mixed or motor nerves that are going to muscles is that after a while, after that, you know, that muscle has been choked off from its innervation, 
it's going to atrophy. You're going to get irreversible fibrosis of that muscle related to the denervation. And I'll be honest with you, nobody knows how long that takes in humans. We think it's somewhere between nine to 12 months. That process starts earlier. We think that you kind of don't gradually back into it. You kind of fall off of a cliff. Uh, and I don't want to be trying to predict, you know, how long it's going to take. I want to intervene sooner rather than later. I, and this is, again, my personal philosophy as a peripheral nerve person is I want to know. And that's where, you know, the earlier follow-up and the serial testing and the earlier explorations, how I approach it, come into play. Yeah, maybe I explore too many nerves, but what about the ones that would not have gotten better if I had just completely watched them? I, I don't want to condemn them. And condemn is probably not the right word, but condemn them to tendon transfers when I think I can intervene sooner and get them something perhaps better by re -innervating. You know, what I've, one thing I've been surprised by is how quickly you will see atrophy. Um, it happens a lot sooner than you think, even within months, you know, two to three months from an actual injury. I've seen patients with, you know, um, with like say high ulnar nerve injuries that have come back and, you know, their, their um, ulnar intrinsics are gone within two months. And it's crazy. Like you would think like there would be something keeping that muscle alive, but you know, there, some of these muscles can be quite sensitive. So it's more of looking for that atrophy, looking for that weakness. You know, one of the biggest things that I think I teach the residents and fellows that come through my service is that you're not going to find weakness in patients unless you really push on them. You really got to look for it because if you, you know, every time a patient, you know, somebody comes out of a room and says, oh, the patient has, you know, grade five strength. I'm like, they just had an injury. They probably don't. And, you know, I just push on them, you know, the same way I push on anybody else and really examine them and interrogate them. Uh, and you will find weakness. You just got to look for it. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to, um, you know, knowing what you're looking for, having a good physical exam, uh, you know, that it seems like those, you know, are the, the basics and the, the basic tools to have. And then all these other tests, just like you said, like an EMG or doing an exploration, all those kind of confirm what you originally came up with from your clinical diagnosis. Yeah, no, it's, it's all about exam. Like I can, you know, and it's one of the things about plexus and nerve is that it, it's intimidating because it is such a comprehensive number of things that you, how you're assessing a patient. Uh, that as a trainee, you know, you're sitting there like, how do I record every muscle innervated from C5 to T1 uh, in sensory depth? But it, when you get good at it and you get standardized at it, it is less than a five minute exam. Um, yeah. It's just getting good, getting systematic and learning what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And so switching, switching gears and kind of now we're talking about kind of the surgical treatment of these nerve injuries. When you look for patients that you think may undergo a primary repair, you know, an end-to-end an -end, um, uh, nerve repair, can you kind of talk us through which patients you choose for that and kind of your technique? You know, I've read up um, about it and I, I've seen different people say, you know, use the 8-0, 9 nylon, you sharp, when, you know, things to look for when you're um, resecting, um, you know, you resect back to, you know, good bleeding nerve, like what all goes into, you know, uh, new repair. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, you touched on the points, uh, that are salient, you know, an early repair is better provided that you know that the nerve is not intact. Uh, when you're dealing with an axonomatic injury, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that internal scarring of the nerve kind of injury, and you know that it has declared itself you typically will know that, you know, and again, like I said, it's kind of controversial, controversial, but like, you know, you'll know that by about the three or four month mark in most cases, or you'll know if it's recovering, you just have to watch it for longer, but you need to keep, you know, uh, you know, have a really keen eye on these patients. Um, but, you know, when you come to the point where you are going to do some kind of nerve repair or reconstruction, um, the points of having a, you know, a healthy soft tissue bed in a non-hostile environment are really critical. You don't want to be doing any nerve repairs in an area where, you know, you're predisposed to scar or hematoma coming back, that kind of thing, because you don't want to jeopardize this kind of big surgery that you're doing. Getting out of the zone of injury on the nerve itself, as we mentioned earlier, is super critical and making sure that you're resecting back to healthy fascicles. And when you're resecting back to healthy fascicles, you truly need to be cutting and, and bread loafing, you know, slicing it like a loaf of bread. So that when you get back to the healthy fascicles, you see these fascicles kind of mushrooming out of the cut nerve end. 
And that's because they're, you know, the, the peripheral nerve is an extension of the blood brain barrier. And there's this resting tension and air pressure in the system. And when you cut back into healthy nerve, those nerves are going to want to, those fascicles are going to spring out at you because you've got this now blood nerve barrier. And when you see good, healthy bleeding vessels inside and you're not seeing scar, like that's the stuff you want to see and you're ready to repair that nerve. Now, oftentimes you, when you're in the setting where you've observed the patient for a while and now you're resecting back to healthy fascicles, you probably have to lay in a nerve graft. If you're lucky, you can repair it primarily. Not lucky, but if you're fortunate, you can repair it primarily. And there's some controversy out there as to which kind of suture you use. I agree with your point that a monofilament is nice because, you know, it's not going to create as much scar um, because of, you know, minimizing the foreign body reactivity. I personally like a nino nylon suture. And we can, if you want to, you know, geek out into the technical details as to why we can. But I think <laughs> yeah, an sure. nylon or nino nylon is suitable. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, so the thing about it, like, so when you have a nerve, the resting tension in that nerve is around, you know, less than 5%. And what you're trying to avoid at your coaptation site is any sort of ischemia, right? Because ischemia is bad for any, you know, regenerating tissue. And as you get beyond 8% strain, you start to get, you know, a little bit of temporary reversible ischemia. And as you get even beyond that into, you know, the 10 to 13 to 15% strain in the nerve, then you get irreversible ischemia and that's what you don't want yeah. because that nerve is now choked off and there's no way it's going to regenerate. It's just going to scar down. So, you know, the dogma has been that if it holds to, if it quote holds together with ADO nylon, you know, it's probably good. It's not under too much tension. Okay. There's a nice study out of Indiana that where they looked at ADO nylon, you know, versus nino nylon and a few other sutures and they looked at the resting tension after you repaired nerves. And nino nylon actually kind of matched up really favorably because, you know, it would, the, the resting tension was around that, you know, less than 8% range. And it never held more than, you know, 8%. Whereas an ADO nylon could hold more than 8% strain on that nerve without rupturing in some cases. And if, you're, if your suture is withstanding that amount of strain, um, uh, strain, it means that your nerve repair is seeing that, and that's going to lead to ischemia. Mm. So for me, I use a nino nylon based on that study because I think that it shows us that you know that is a uh, that is a nerve that is not under excessive tension. That nerve repair is not seeing excessive strain. Now, as far as technique wise, for when you when you're doing these primary repairs. Do you do group fascicular versus epineurial? Uh, and can you kind of touch on what each are? And then I guess kind of the high points to know about um, e each of them. Yeah, so I mean, an epineurial repair is, you know, basically uh, using the lining up, the, like it says, the epineurium only. And a lot of times there are, you know, those um, blood vessels we talked about at the very beginning along the external aspect of the epineurium that you can use to help line it up. You know, but it is basically, it isn't, you know, you're doing some guesswork and you're trying to get these nerve endings close to each other, but not completely opposed so that they can regenerate down these channels. What you want to do as a peripheral, when you're doing peripheral nerve repair, is you want to let the nerve figure it out. You want to set it up for success. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I think that 95% of my nerve repairs are epineural, but, you know, there is a very small uh, cohort of patients or cases in which I'll do a group fascicular repair. And I think the good example of that is are cases in which you have incredibly reliable topography. And the, the best example of that is the ulnar nerve in the distal forearm, um, where you can line up, you know, sensory to sensory and motor to motor based on that incredibly reliable topography. And, you know, a lot of that work has been done by Susan McKinnon in terms of mapping out topography, but many people before her, you know, Mike uh, Jabali, has done that in the past. And then Sunderland had his own maps uh, of the topography. Um, but in oftentimes, like, you know, when you're looking at a, 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 you know, for example, the radial nerve in the, you know, the middle of the arm, there's no way you're going to get that topography aligned perfectly. So just try to get the blood vessels lined up as, as nicely and as, you know, loosely as possible with your epineural repair. Okay, very good. So that's kind of touching on group fascicular versus epineural. So say, for example, 
actually uh, one more thing i saw some um things on some people just talk about just using fiber and glue alone some people talk about using a nerve connector can you kind of talk about you know i guess your experience with these or is this something that you do when if you're doing um if you're trying to you know if it's the gap's not that long or gap's not that large and you want to try to do a repair do you just use fiber and glue alone or you know can you kind of touch on that yeah, man, I don't know how much time you have for this topic, but, but uh, <laughs> you know, in, in our very small fiefdom of peripheral nerve, this is a, you know, at least a connector part is pretty controversial, but I will say that most peripheral nerve surgeons will, you know, and hand surgeons will use fiber and glue. Um, you know, like you mentioned here, and I'd like to talk about whenever I put my slides together is that it is not FDA approved for nerve repair. It's off label. That being said, a lot of people do it. A lot of people would consider it, you know, uh, routine. Um, and what you're doing with the fiber and glue is that you're using this adhesive cylinder. And some people, particularly in like a baby plexus or whatever, uh, will do, you know, just lay the nerve ends next to each other and glue it down. Some people believe that this glue is only present for about seven days. I read some literature saying it's present for, you know, honestly about 21 days. Um, but you're hoping that the nerve can repair or can regenerate across, you know, end to end within that glue by the time that that glue is no longer there. Um, there are studies showing that it, you know, a nerve can regenerate across that glue. It is not a barrier to regeneration. Um, you know, and it, it is one way to ensure that you don't have excessive tension at your repair site. I personally like to use it to augment a repair. It, you know, uh, literature uh, shows that it doesn't increase the load to failure of a nerve repair, but it does increase the resistance to gapping. So it does add something to a repair. But I do like to align things with, you know, the 9 nylon, uh, depending on the size of the nerve, that can be anywhere between two to six stitches, and then putting the glue on to help solidify it. And that's mainly, honestly, so I can get the nerve, the patient's, the, you know, the patient moving faster um, while that glue is intact. Like, for example, like say you do a digital nerve, and you've got to get the finger moving uh, for the flexor tendons because you've done a flexor tendon repair at the same time or you've done a replant and you want to get things moving. You don't want the nerve repair to be the limiting factor in that because then you've hosed the rest of the finger if you don't let the finger move you know, with the flexor tendons. And in terms of connectors, you know, I think that uh, the emergence of nerve allograft, for example, for like a digital nerve has probably supplanted the role of a connector if you have a short gap. I don't love connectors mainly, and, and this reminds me of a podcast that I listened to from the chef Dave Chang, where they have a, a segment called My Opinion is Fact. Uh, I'll go into yeah. a little bit about that, but I think that, uh, you know, a nerve connector adds a lot of scar and based on the commercially available ones. And, you know, I will say I don't have any existing relationships with any of the companies that make nerve connectors. I have done some ad hoc consulting for Axgen in the past and the monies have gone directly to the hand society. Uh, but, you know, I think that those connectors create scar and that's based on what I've seen, what the sur senior surgeons who have taught me have seen, and then what, you know, some of our, uh, my partner Dave Bergen's lab um, uh, experience has shown is that these collagen connectors create a ton of scar. Uh, so and, I, don't, I don't love them and I don't rely on them. I don't use them personally. And with these nerve connectors, these are just, you know, this is, um something that you use or you just put the stumps inside of the connectors and then you just suture the a, the uh, the connector to the epineurium of the nerves. And then they, they're supposed to have some some factors right inside of that, that nerve connector that helps, you know, the nerves uh, figure out which way to, I guess, form or Well, or you're grow. providing an environment correct? for the nerves to grow to for the proximal stump to regenerate across the distal stump. I get yeah. the argument that some people say that, you know, by putting the nerve ends within the connector and then suturing further back from, you know, the, uh, the gap between the nerves, you're taking tension off of a potential repair site. I understand the argument. I'm not saying that it's wrong to do it. It's just not what I do. Because there are a lot of, a lot of really skilled surgeons and really well-known surgeons who, uh, who use connectors and use conduits. It's just not what I do. Okay. And I don't want to take up too much of your time, but let's say, for example, you know, we had this patient, they had this nerve injury, we did the exploration. I know earlier you mentioned that you should probably have an, some type of graft, you know, on your on your head, just thinking about it. But say, for example, you resected back to healthy, uh, healthy, uh, healthy nerve, 
and there's a gap say there's a you know a gap of of four centimeters or so what i guess for you what what is the gap um what is the gap that you will then say oh i need to go ahead and use an autograft or an algraft for this or you know is there a certain number i've seen some studies say that bridging a gap more than three centimeters or some say up to six centimeters do you have you know anything that you go by I personally think five to six centimeters is probably, you know, the, the kind of gap where I'm uh, talking to patients and saying, Hey, you know, this was a, I'm going to do it, but you know, I don't, I don't have the greatest hopes for it. I think, you know, when you're honestly, when you're doing this kind of stuff uh, on the regular and, you know, you cut back to healthy fascicles, a three centimeter gap is like, wow, that was great. You know, cause it's not that bad. Uh, you know, so, and then, you know, when I start to think about grafting, Again, you know, we get back to my opinion is fact kind of segments. I, I don't think allograft at this point in the literature has a role uh, routinely for anything other than maybe digital nerves. Um, you know, I don't like using it for mixed or motor sensory or mixed or motor nerves um, purely. I think that, you know, there are a lot of, again, really smart and really well-known people that will use nerve repair uh, into nerve allograft in their nerve reconstructions for something other than a digital nerve. Um, but, you know, here's where I'll say that, you know, as, as you're a consumer of the literature, as you are, you know, especially when you're a trainee and you're a junior surgeon, look at the disclosures, you know, this, this paper you're showing me, you know, um, you know, there are a number of papers out there that, you know, are funded by industry and there's obviously mm. some potential conflicts, some potential right. bias. I'm not saying that that's going to truly influence it uh, in terms of you know how the authors come to their conclusions, but you just need to be aware of that. And I think that right. there have been enough papers published um, by centers that are not funded by um, you know by industry that have demonstrated the um, the effectiveness of nerve allograft for purely sensory nerve, particularly digital nerves, where I'm down for that. But if you look at the mixed and motor uh, cohorts, a lot of it is funded by industry. Again, that doesn't make it bad science. It doesn't make it bad work. Uh, it's just, you know, you have to keep that conflict of interest in mind. And I think that you need to think about if this was your own nerve or your mom's nerve, like what would you want? Um, and I think if I personally, you know, had a mixed or a motor deficit, I'd want somebody taking my sural nerve and putting it in there. Right. And kind of going back and, and touching base on autographed. I know there's, you know, there's different terms, you know, cable, trunk. Uh, can you kind of go through, you know, the nerve autographs, what the kind of terminology is, and then, you know, kind of talk about, I know you just mentioned the sural uh, nerve. Are there any other nerves that you may possibly go to if you're thinking, you know, uh, that you want to use a nerve autograft and what goes into your head when you try to decide what autograft you want to use is it just is, is it just because it's a uh, motor nerve versus a mixed nerve versus just a purely sensory you know all that yeah I mean I think it kind of depends on what your deficit is right so if you have a digital nerve for example or the superficial radial nerve and you want to repair or reconstruct it with a, a graft um, you know a single strand graft uh, can be very helpful and useful. And I think that, you know, there's a nice paper out of uh, Baltimore. I think Jim Higgins was the first author in JHS in like the early 2000s, where they looked at the different nerve graft options. And then they looked at the different segments where you would be working on a digital nerve, for example, and looked at where the good size match was. And that's a really helpful paper. If you're, you know, a hand fellow or a senior resident, you know, that'll help you figure out what you want to use. Um, you know, but I will say, you know, if it's purely sensory nerve, allograft in my practice has supplanted going and, you know, having that donor site morbidity. If I'm doing a, if I'm using an autograft, it usually is in a cabled fashion. What you don't want to do is make the nerve graft, you know, for example, like if you had a complete freebie and you could just harvest somebody's ulnar nerve and plop it into somebody's, uh, you know, brachial plexus, you can't just do that without a vascular supply because what's going to happen is that you have a really thick caliber kind of uh, nerve graft you're putting in 
if you don't attach a blood supply, you're going to get central necrosis because that nerve graft is completely reliant on blood supply coming in from both ends and coming in from the local environment via imbibition. Um, and if you don't provide blood supply, that really thick graft is going to fail. You can probably graft, you know, use a cable graft of like three or four um, cables in parallel um, without attaching a blood supply. And we do that routinely. And I like a sural nerve because usually, like I mentioned, if I'm doing a cabled autograft, it's for a mixed or a motor nerve. And the sural nerve provides the most fascicles. It's a great bang for your buck kind of thing because when we're doing this, it's a pretty you know, high stakes kind of thing. And I think most people would agree if you're doing a mixed or motor, use a sural nerve until you run out of sural nerve. Um, you know, it's, it, uh, the next other nerves you could use are things, you know, for example, if you're operating in upper extremity already, you could use things like lateral interbrachial cutaneous, medial brachial cutaneous, medial interbrachial, PIN, AIN, a lot of options. Um, but they each, you know, that, uh, that fascicular count and the diameter drops off once you get past Searle. Um, LABC is pretty good, um, you know, but it's, it's not as good as Searle. So, you know, in that high stakes kind of thing, until you run out of Searle, I would use Searle. Okay. And so just to kind of review, so a, a cable autograph, that's where you kind of have multiple, you know, small nerve graphs and you put those in parallel and you try to span a gap. And then the vascularized nerve graphs, I mean, that's, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, some nerve graphs. We, it also has uh, a, uh, a blood supply to it as well. Yeah, and it's a flap. The, it's like a free flap. Or if right. you rotate it, it's a pedicle flap, but yeah. Okay. And then the trunk, and, and that can be kind of mixed motor or sensory nerve graphs, is that correct? Yeah, I think it's, un, it's, it's in, I mean, I think it'd be incredibly rare if you're actually using a trunk graph, but yeah. Okay, that's good. And, and what technical tips do you have? So say for example, you know, you have your resident's gonna come with, or let's say your fellow's gonna come with you in the OR tomorrow and you all plan to do a nerve autograph. What are some of the things that you may show this, this guy or lady in the OR that, hey, these are some technical tips uh, regarding these, these nerve autographs that you should know, especially if you plan to do these on the future? Um, you know, I think you get out of the zone of injury, um, cut back to healthy nerve in order to do that. And then, you know, tension-free repair you don't want to mash the fascicles together. You don't want extruding fascicles. So you're basically trying to line up the epineurium in a manner to set this nerve up for success. I've heard people say it a couple of different ways in terms of analogies that will probably resonate with people. It's like kissing your grandma. You don't want to make, you want to make <laughs> contact, but you don't want anything more than that. <laughs> the, a, the, the cruder one. and more memorable way that I've heard is from Milan Stevanovich um, out at USC. He will say, kissing, not sex. Mm, exactly. So you want those nerve ends just touching. And you don't, <laughs> when you look at this nerve repair under the microscope, you don't want to see any fascicles kind of coming out of the repair site. You want to make this tidy but you don't want to crush it. So as much as you don't want fascicles escaping and extruding out, you don't want fascicles, you know, almost invaginating back on themselves. Um, so you really got to take some time. And the hard, not the hard part, but the, the interesting part about nerve repair is that, you know, we spend all this time exposing the nerves and getting them ready. And, you know, for sometimes like exposed in a brachial plexus. And then you're, you know, you reach this apex of the case and then you got to do the micro. And that's when you let your attention slip. And it's almost like, you know, one of the partners, Marty Boyer will say like these long cases will take as long as you let them, they will suck up as much time as you give them. So you have to stay on offense the whole time and stay sharp the whole time and be technically, you know, on top of it the whole time. Um, so you can't let your guard down um, once you get to the part where you're under the microscope and you're repairing the nerve. Excellent. All solid tips. I, I hope anybody that is going to do a nerve repair tomorrow that is listening this to this episode in preparation comes with all that. You'll sound really smart and, um, you know, that's, that's great. And just before we wrap up here, can we kind of just touch on rehabilitation? So say, you know, you've done a, a nerve autograph on a patient, you've done, you know, you've taken some of their serial nerve and you've done it and you've and it's somewhere in the, in the forearm, you know, what, what does your uh, rehabilitation look like? Do you have them splinting? I know you talked a little bit earlier about kind of um, augmenting with fiber and glue. That way they can kind of start some motion. But 
in general, do you have a, a, a protocol? Well, so, I mean, I think that, you know, you have to, to be what I think sets orthopedic surgeons and plastic surgeons apart uh, is that we understand the extremities, particularly orthopedic surgeons and nothing against our plastics and neurosurgery colleagues, but we understand the extremities. You understand everything else that comes with it. Um, and so, you know, you recognize like in your injury, in the forearm that you're describing, you're going to have flexor tendons that are gliding by that. Your nerve is going to be in the most tension when, you're, when your wrist is in extension um, and your fingers are, you know, flexing and extending with the wrist in extension. So if you repair your nerve in the potential position of maximum tension, you're going to set yourself up for success and minimize the, the chances of catastrophic failure. So either repair your nerve with the wrist and extension um, and then passively check it, you know, with the finger, you know, passively flex and extend the fingers to make sure, or repair your nerve and then bring it back into extension before you glue it and you can't see anything and check it and make sure your nerve repair is solid um, and there's no gapping because that will tell you what you can do after surgery. I put the glue on as an augment. You know, I talked with, uh, you know, Amy Moore and I have had this discussion. She's a plastic surgeon who is now chief of plastics uh, at Ohio State, but she used to be at Wash U. And we would have these like Tuesday morning nerve conversations. Uh, and we recalled one of them recently for a podcast episode where we talked about, you know, how, how long does it take to a nerve, for a nerve to be repaired, like how to regenerate across a coaptation. And the best literature we have is probably, you know, that it's about three weeks until that blood nerve barrier is restored. But, you know, we, we tend to think of it a little bit, you know, analogously to like what we think about for like flexor tendons, for example, which is a completely different tissue and it's an unfair comparison, you know, but a tendon repair starts to accrue strength by about three weeks. You know, if you're a budding peripheral nerve person or hand person and want to, you know, do a reasonable lab experiment, that would be very helpful or even a clinical experiment, you can tell us like, you know, how long it takes, truly takes for a nerve repair to be like, you know, signed, sealed and delivered. Um, but based on that, I like to move patients as quickly as possible if it's appropriate and it's going to be beneficial. You know, there's some times where you're kind of boxed in based on the circumstances of the nerve repair or the circumstances of the other musculoskeletal orthopedic issues. You know, for example, say you're doing, you know, elbow contracture release and you're doing an, uh, an ulnar nerve at the same time, stuff like that comes up and you obviously want to get the elbow moving, you better make sure that your nerve repair is going to be solid when the elbow is cycled through a bunch of motion. Otherwise, you're going to have to, you know, hamper the other component of that patient's rehab. Like, I mean, you can make the argument that like, you know, doing nerve is more important and the elbow, you can always redo the contracture release, but it's just things to consider. Be a consummate right. orthopedic surgeon. And and in general, how are the results for these patients that you do these nerve repairs on? I, uh, just researching, you know, preparing for this podcast, I've seen, um, I've seen a wide variety of of, of uh, things in the literature. I, you know, one of the studies that it seems is, is mentioned as one of the historic studies is what they, you know, found out of World War II, looking at that that series of injuries uh, versus some of the more recent. Um, more recent literature that states you know you can have good return to function you know 80 percent of the time depending on what the injury is but do you have anything that that you think you know the people listening should know about the the results of these types of injuries well i mean you know i think that there are some cases in which you can hit an absolute home run um but most cases are not that because that's not how you know uh fate god whatever you believe in deals it to you um, but a couple of phrases that come to mind, you know, I'd say probably overall, just in the, not in a glib way, but, you know, good, not great in terms of results. Conversely, I would say um, what Sterling Bunnell would say, you know, the, the founder of the field of hand surgery, to someone who has nothing, a little bit is a lot. Mm. Um, you know, I think that, you know, those are, those probably sum up best, you know, uh, you know, where we are with peripheral nerve. Uh, even in 2021, where I feel like we've made a lot of advances, particularly with things like nerve transfers, which can help provide a lot of excellent, you know, not excellent, but good function. Um, you know, it's those kind of innovations that are going to keep us moving forward. Um, but one of the reasons why I like peripheral nerve is that it's challenging. It's humbling. It's technically demanding. It keeps you hungry. 
um, because we're always trying to figure out like how we can make it better. We're not trying to take an implant that has 95% survivorship and turn it to 97%. And no offense to our orthoplasty colleagues, <laughs> but you know yeah. there is there is definitely a lot of runway to make things better, uh, and you're not going to bump up against much of a ceiling effect. Excellent, totally understand. And last thing before we just wrap up here, you know, just reading there are all there are little there are um, other medications that it seems like people are starting to use, you know, or, or at least, you know, experimenting with or doing some research on that may aid in, you know, nerve repair, you know, these like ganglioside, you know, I saw that there's something that if you have um, antibodies, you know, for these gang ganglioside, they can actually inhibit, um, inhibit, you know, nerves from regenerating. So there's, there's some, uh, medications out there against the ganglia size is there any your intubation chamber do you, do you have any experience with any of these or um, any uh, anything that you think is important to know about these different um, considerations for nerve repair you know i think that the ones you've listed are not ones that are mainstream um, i don't know enough to say whether they're uh, i don't think that they're good for the nerve but they're not i don't i don't know enough to say whether they're bad for the nerve Okay. That being said, I'm not an expert in these particular things that you've mentioned. I will say there are probably some game-changing things that are going to be coming up, you know, in 10 to 15 years. You know, things like PEG fusion, I think, are really interesting for nerve repair. And we're fortunate enough at WashU to be involved in a, uh, um, in a clinical uh, trial, multi-center study for that. I mean, I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that comes about. So, you know, nerve repair uh, may look different in, you know, 2041. Uh, when you're a season attending versus, you know, when I'm, you know, retiring. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of room for improvement. I'm not going to poo-poo anything. Um, I will say that there, you know, some of the work that we've done recently looking at um, things like social media uh, with patients with nerve injuries, uh, there are a lot of predatory marketing practices that go on out there, you know, magically offering cures, kind of charlatan-esque kind of stuff. And occasionally a patient yeah. will fall for it. I had a patient of mine that had a plexus injury who we did a nerve reconstruction on and he went and paid $15,000 to have somebody put stem cells in his neck, you know, with no express guarantee or assurances that it would actually work, but just for hope. Uh, and right. that kind of brings me to one of my points that I, I try to impart to my trainees when they come through the rotation, you know, in a non cheesy way, but like, you know, the, the psychology of this injury, you know, particularly the plexus injuries are so devastating that, you know, uh, the emotional part of it is as hard, if not harder than the physical part of it. Um, so that's probably one thing to consider, you know, if you choose to go into the field, the nerve, which a lot of people are really, you know, within the hand world are really interested in, you have to be prepared for all of the psychological components. I won't call it baggage, um, but the psychological uh, and emotional components that come with that injury, because you're going to have patients that look for the stuff that you described because, you know, they, they have a lot of time on their hands now. They're not working. Google. <laughs> They're going to be on Google. They're going to be getting yeah. ads. You know, you have they to be are. ready to answer this kind of stuff uh, because they will be desperate. Excellent. Well, well, Doctor D, I think this was a a great talk great. on um on nerve injuries. We talked about you know repairing. We talked about allograft. We talked about autograph. We talked about the you know anatomy for you know nerves. We talked about the uh, classification system. You know, I really appreciate you coming on, taking out your time of your day to come on a Nail It Ortho podcast. Now, we always do it for our listeners. If, you know, if we always put some type of way that they can reach out to you, I know you definitely have a, you know, have social media pages if you want to mention your Twitter or how people can follow you or reach out to you if they want to. Yeah, thanks. For, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Um, you know, feel free to check out our podcast. It's, uh, it's called The Upper Hand, Chuck and Chris Talk Hand Surgery. It's on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate all of you that may be listening to, to Nailed It as well as to The Upper Hand. And then maybe we can win over a few of your loyal oh, yeah. Nailed It uh, subscribers. Um, you know, so uh, if you want to reach me, my email is D as in dog, Y as in yellow, C as in Chris at wustl.edu. Uh, on social, uh, Twitter and Instagram, it's uh, C H R I S D Y M D. Uh, feel free to reach out. Would love to hear from anybody. And I thank, thank both of you for having me on the podcast. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I love talking about nerves. Uh, and I hope, you know, uh, it's been useful to everybody who's been listening.
Well, Dr. D, again, we really appreciate it. And for the listeners, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Please do not forget to hit that subscribe button as well as go and leave a review and tell us all how much you love this episode with Dr. D. So again, we really appreciate it.